And I'm going to welcome everyone to Conversations in Optic Nerve and Retinal Vascular Disease, presented by Optometric Education Consultants, with Dr. Joe Salka as our speaker. And I'm going to be your moderator and host. And we have Vanessa on tonight as our uh, COPE administrator. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker. As I think most of you know, Joe is, was a professor at... Uh, Nova Southern University College of Optometry for about 28 and a half years. Here he served as the Chief of Advanced Care Service, Director of Glaucoma Service, and the Chair of the Department of Optometric Service. Joe also is a founding member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and the Optometric Retina Society. For the Academy, he chairs Neuroophthalmic Disorders in Optometry. I think most of us know Joe is also a gifted writer. He has published hundreds of articles. He is also the lead author of uh, the annual handbook of ocular disease management. I think most of us are, are familiar with that through review of optometry. Joe, I'd like to say thank you for, for doing that. With that being said, Joe is also uh, a well-known national and international lecturer, which we'll find out tonight uh, how nice it is and how good a job he does. Um, I'd like to thank Joe for being here. Joe, thanks for being a good friend, good friend of optometry. Joe is currently practicing in Sarasota, Florida for Center for Sight. With that being said, let's give Joe a big round, virtual round of applause. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Greg. Okay, our topic tonight is conversations in optic nerve and retinal vascular disease. And I, I, I think some of our best learning comes from friends talking to friends and colleagues talking to colleagues about interesting cases and how we, we all learn. So this will be all a really case-based uh, presentation. I'm on the advisory boards of Novartis, Glacos, Airy, Bausch & Loam, um, Allergan, and Ocular Therapeutics. I have no financial interest in any uh, products and I am a co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants with Greg. So we're going to start off with a 28-year-old female who presents with intermittent blurred vision and visual gray outs and intermittent horizontal double vision and a chronic headache steadily getting worse over two weeks. She claims white coat hypertension. The doctor makes her nervous and she has a shoulder injury for she is using Flexeril. And she is five foot three and 220 pounds. So she'd fall in the obese category. She's 20, 20 in each eye. Her pupils and motilities are all normal. And this is what we see. She has bilaterally swollen optic nerves. We can actually see some juxtapapillary folds or what is known as patents folds uh, in both, uh, opt, uh, both fundi going from the disc toward the macula. As you look, the vessels superiorly, the major and minor vessels superiorly and inferiorly are all obscured and we can't really see them very well. And that's very characteristic of, uh, of disc edema. So we're gonna to wanna to probably go a little bit more into the history and we're gonna to wanna to order some, some testing on this patient. And with that, Greg, we're gonna launch our first polling question. What is the next medical test that this patient needs? Is it MRI, MRV, CT, or LP? As we're going through, I'm going to have to acknowledge that this is solely my, my responsibility of not a great question. But people are hitting fast and furious. and we'll go through all of them in just a second. All right, Greg, I think we're getting close to the end. Hey, Joe, we started at about 7.15, so just so yeah. you know mm -hmm. that we'll have to make sure we do the proper timing. All right, we have over 90% people have responded. So I'm gonna end the poll. I'm going to share the results with the crowd and uh, I'll stop it here and stop sharing in a second here, Joe. You know, so go right ahead. All right, well, MRI is, is number one. And yeah, that, that is gonna be done. 
CT is at 18%. If, if, a patient, if a patient is sent to an ER with no direction, they're going to get a CT scan because that's what they're due. Lumbar puncture, I think everybody is, is suspecting this is papilledema or increased intracranial pressure, maybe in something called pseudotumor. And yeah, that is something that is done after the MRI because we have to make sure that there, uh, there's no hydrocephalic state or anything that's going to push the, the brain stem down through the frame and magnum when they, they, they tap this person. Something very, very uh, low is MRV, and believe it or not, MRV is actually very important. That goes along with MRI. When we have disc edema or suspect papilledema, we're going to be doing MRI and MRV, looking for a venous sinus thrombosis. So everything is, is, is good in a way, but really, and, and this is, this is my, uh, my mistake, the most important thing to do in a situation like this, when you see bilateral disc edema, check the blood pressure. Any good neuro ophthalmologist will say the first thing you do is check the blood pressure because this could be malignant hypertension. Well, she has a dull ringing in her ears. Her blood pressure is 142 over 100. Elevated but not malignant hypertension. Biomicroscopy is unremarkable. Pressure is normal at 16. Visual field, she had blind spot enlargement and a nasal step uh, defect in each eye. She did get medical evaluation. Sur serologically, she was normal. Imaging shows some small ventricles, but otherwise normal. She did undergo LP. Her opening pressure is 510. Should have been about half of that. There's no blood. There's no white blood cells. There's no si signs of, uh, of, of things culturing out. C CSF is all normal. So she had a diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri. But specifically, she has papilledema. That's edema of the optic disc due to elevated intracranial pressure. Now, there are various signs and symptoms of papilledema. Signs, bilateral disc edema is the rule. I have indeed seen a, one case in my entire career of unilateral papilledema. Like glaucoma, the superior and inferior optic nerve is most susceptible. And this is where we're going to uh, see obliteration of the smaller vessels and the major vessels. We look, we look north and south in the optic nerve. The cup will become obliterated. Hemorrhages are common early in the disease. And there's no, no spontaneous venous pulsation. And patents folds, while not diagnostic, are characteristic of advancing and regressing edema uh, in a patient who actually does have elevated intracranial pressure. Visual field defects uh, are highly variable. Usually have a large blind spot early in the disease, but it develops a glaucoma-like appearance with arcuate defects. And as the disease becomes chronic, there'll be constricted visual fields. Because of the bilaterality and symmetry, there's generally no relative afro defect. And visual acuity is pretty well near normal unless it's very advanced disease. Symptoms, transient visual obscurations. They not black out, but they gray out. And it tends to be bilateral. And will often happen as they stoop over, bend over, reach for something below, you know, below their waist. Intermittent horizontal double vision with an abduction deficit or six nerve paresis is all very, always very common. Not going to be vertical, it's going to be horizontal. Headache is very common. Nausea and vomiting, the four the fourth ventricle is a, na is a vomit center. As that expands from increased intracranial pressure, it causes projectile vomiting or vomiting without nausea. The reason is because people who are vomiting will be will become dehydrated. And when they're dehydrated, it's trying to, the brain is trying to lower the intracranial pressure. Dizziness and tinnitus can also happen, but it's not, they're not terribly common. Papilledema comes in acute, chronic, or atrophic. Acute lower left, we see hemorrhages, exudates, it's very wet and mucky, very hyperemic. There's quite a bit of retinal nerve fiber layer edema. As it becomes more chronic, that edema starts, the, the nerve fiber layer edema starts to regress, giving the folds or the patents folds. There's not as much hemorrhage or exudate there and collateral vascularization may actually develop. 
that's the, the middle one. And the lower right is atrophic. You know, there'll be disc, disc atrophy, disc pallor, and a loss of the swollen appearance because dead things don't swell. So it will become flatter and atrophic. Now this edema is from axoplasmic status, uh, stasis, intracranial, uh, intracellular fluids, metabolic byproducts are being regurgitated uh, at the level of the optic nerve. And in papal edema, the cerebral edema is elevated and it's being translated and transmitted along the common meningeal sheaths of the brain, the optic nerve, giving this engorged swollen optic nerve. Now this can be from various intracranial abnormalities, increased brain volumes, as we see it in the lower left, the large tumor causing midline shift, increased blood volume from an intracranial hemorrhage, and that's why CT is actually very important. You can see it's white with CT, and increased cerebral spinal fluid uh, volume from hydro hydrocephalus. Now you don't need a huge tumor like this to cause papilledema. If there's a small lesion that is blocking ventricular flow, it can lead to this hydrocephalic state. Also being a sinus thrombosis. When suspecting papilledema, and this is a clinical suspicion, it is not a clinical diagnosis. We don't diagnose it until we know that they actually have increased intracranial pressure. Now we want to make sure we, we rule out the masqueraders. Ultrasound is very helpful in identifying disc drusen. OCT is very helpful in identifying disc drusen. I will give you a clinical pearl that may not be written down anywhere. But on an OCT, nasal thickness of greater than 88 microns is more associated with optic disc edema than optic disc drusen. That's the number I, I can remember easily and hold on to. Now, if it's under 88, it doesn't mean it isn't disc edema, but if it goes over 88, nasal thickness on your OCT, it's more likely to be disc, disc edema. And look at the color of the disc, look at the margins, look for a spontaneous venous pulsation, look for an abnormal vascular branching pattern. But acute papilledema is a medical emergency. We, we need pretty stat neuroimaging to rule out an intracranial mass, an intracranial infection, uh, an intracranial, intracranial bleed. Best place to do that is in a hospital. In a hospital emergency room, as long as the ER physician is giving some, some, some direction, that they really need this help. In my practice, I, you know, I'm, we're on call for the hospital and I get ER physicians calling me late at night just to run something by you. Now, if the imaging is normal, lumbar puncture is going to be done, and I'm, I'll give you a caveat, it's being done less to measure the pressure and exclude meningitis and other disease processes. Atrophic papilledema with significant vision loss is also emergency because they're going blind. And if they have other neurologic abnormalities, such as fever or stiff neck, you know, they have an intracranial process and this is also an emergency. Now, I wanna give you a caveat and, and qualify this. If you have bilateral champagne corks popping into the vitreous, that's pretty well identifiable. We know what to do. But what about that subtle elevated optic nerve where you're not just quite sure. In that situation, it may not be quite as uh, urgent. So in those situations, in especially asymptomatic patient, take your time and get information, do what we do best and do what we do well. Get an OCT, optic nerve and the macula. Do a visual field, check the pupils, do color vision. These are all things that are very important that we can do because once they get downstream, none of this is going to be done. It's not going to be done in the ER. Uh, they're not going to be seeing ophthalmologist. The neurologist is not going to do it. And maybe not even the neuro-ophthalmologist. Now I want to clarify, you know, Greg and I have talked about this uh, at length uh, at our, you know, face-to-face -face, our live conferences. Pseudotumor and IIH or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. What is the right term to use? I'm going to shed the light on this. Pseudotumor 
means there's no tumor. It's increased intracranial pressure, but there's no mass lesion. But there are many other causative agents that have been identified. Tetracycline use, vitamin A use, um, oral contraceptive use, venous sinus thrombosis. These are all things that increase intracranial pressure, but it's not a brain tumor. In these cases, we call this secondary pseudotumor. Now, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, IIH, it's the same situation, but there's no identifiable cause. And these are usually younger obese females uh, at risk. So IIH is actually pseudotumor. It's primary pseudotumor. If there's a cause, it's secondary pseudotumor. So to, pseudotumor is still a very good term to use. It is pretty encompassing. And IIH is not appropriate if there's some other cause, such as venous sinus thrombosis. And this is all coming down to likely poor cerebral spinal fluid drainage. So, now, Jeff, I, yeah. so, so can we just kind of tell how that conversation kind of went uh, when you were teaching me that, in a sense? Um, you know, I, I was going over, you know, uh, a... You know, complications from oral and topical pharmaceuticals, systemic on this. That's the lecture that I was doing. Joe was sitting in on it and I was showing multiple times. It usually happens about four times a year where I have someone that comes in with doxycycline, minocycline that has a swollen optic nerve head. And I was calling it idiopathic. And at the end, you know, Joe kind of was going, why are you calling it idiopathic? I'm like, well, that's what it is. He's like, what's it from? Doxycycline then it's not idiopathic. So then you taught me what, Joe, that it was secondary, right? Secondary, yeah, secondary, pseudotumor. secondary pseudotumor, right? Mm -hmm. Cerebri. So, and that's what I put in the charts now. So that's how that conversation kind of went to kind of bring a little bit to life of how that was going on and how you can implement it in the practice. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, pseudotumor is a good term. It's pretty encompassing. IIH is a very specific term, but may not be apl applicable. So they have to signs and symptoms as I discussed, uh, that indicate increased, potentially increased intracranial pressure and disc edema, papilledema, but it may be subtle, okay, may be very subtle. And they have to have a normal neurologic examination. The caveat is they can have a six nerve palsy. They can have a bilateral six nerve palsy. And the reason is when the intracranial pressure elevates, it herniates the brainstem down through frame and magnum, stretches the one or both nerves against the clivus giving you six nerve palsy. Very, very common. Neuroimaging has to be normal without hydrocephalus, no mass lesion, no structural knee lesion, no transverse or venous sinus thrombosis. The CSS have, has to be normal, no blood, no white cells, no, no fungi, no culturing. And there has to be an elevated opening pressure. Uh, in the adults 250, children 250 or 280, depending on, on the situation. Now, I'm gonna share something that's a little bit different and understand that not everybody's gonna get a lumbar puncture. More physicians are, are deferring lumbar puncture if certain criteria are, are going to be met. The imaging studies are really good. I mean, MRI is very good and they found a couple of things that have been very characteristic. One, the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is gelatinous and with increased intracranial pressure gets squashed down in the cella tursca and the cella tursca looks empty. So an empty cella on MRI, that'll do it. The globes are actually flattened. You can actually have flattening of the globe from the increased intracranial pressure that is easily able to see on an MRI. That's very characteristic. Now, if they have that and the MRV shows no venous sinus thrombosis, no bleed, no mass lesion, no hydrocephalus, and the patient is not febrile or have any evidence of fever or acute infection, a lot of physicians will actually obviate the, L, the LPI, and particularly if they're the typical patient profile, you know, if they have some causative agent or if uh, the they, they IIH presentation, they may not actually go ahead and do the lumbar puncture. That would be enough. But the important thing is, you know, no evidence of anything else going on. Now, managing pseudotumor, 
there's no visual loss, you know, headache therapy. Acetazolamide can be used along with weight reduction. Mild vision loss, acetazolamide is going to be used. Furosemide, topiramate, ozonistamide will also be used as diuretics. Topiramate is an, actually an anti-seizure medicine that has more off-label uses than it has on-label. It is very good for headaches, so that's beneficial. It's got weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitor properties, that's beneficial. And it's an appetite suppressant and helps with weight loss. But weight, is also, weight reduction is also very important. Prognosis, if we catch it early, is really pretty, pretty good. You know, six to nine months with weight loss and headache therapy and, and carbonic and hydrase inhibitor use, they're gonna they're generally gonna do well. They're gonna resolve. Here's where we need to get involved. Follow up, visual fields. We need to be doing photos and fields to follow these patients. Initially three months, three months, then six months and six months. And if there's anything that's changing for the worse, we need to interpret that for other physicians. I can guarantee the neurologist is not doing this and the internist is not doing this. Once the patient gets downstream, this doesn't get done. It's very important. And weight loss. We got to treat the primary problem. Recommend about 10%. And a 220 woman, that's 22 pounds. Easier said than done. That may need, may require a primary care physician. It may actually require a dietitian. And they need, need to keep the weight down. You know, I've, I've seen numerous patients that told me their headache got, they had, their headache got better with weight loss or they've gained some weight and they come in with a headache. And I've had situations where I've discussed this with a patient and as they're getting, getting referred to neurology but before that visit, they're losing weight and they come in and they're, they're actually doing better. They, they feel it almost immediately. Now here's a nice example, 17 year old female, five foot four, 155 pounds, BMI not that high, 20, you know, about 26. She has headache with exercise, she's 20, 20 HI. Looks like it's been very chronic. We have swollen optic nerves, very symmetrical. We, we have difficulty seeing some of the vessels superiorly and inferiorly. She has enlarged blind spots here, very, very, off the scale OCT, what we see here on the cirrus is this red, white, and blue pattern uh, from the juxtapapillary edema. It's red, white, and blue. We call that the Patriot sign. And if you've never heard of the Patriot sign, it's because I've invented the term. I'm trying to get it into our vernacular and into our jargon and, and get people using it because I like it. 33-year-old female complains of horizontal double vision and headache. Now she had a very, very subtle sixth nerve palsy. And when looking for these sixth nerve palsies, my resident who, who was the primary caregiver said, I, I don't see any motility deficits because she was standing right in front of the patient. The patient was converging. When you have the patient look at the, at the chart down the room, you can see the ESO posture. Headache, transient visual obscurations about 20 times per day, denied oral contraceptives, touch of cycling, vitamin A use. She had lost about 10 pounds before she came in, so her headaches were getting better. Blood pressure not elevated and almost virtually the exact same BMI as the last patient. And this is what she looked like, kind of a chronic disc edema bilateral, very symmetrical. She has a little bit of field loss in the arcuate zone in the right eye and a, a large blind spot in the left. Very, very pronounced uh, thick juxtapapillary thickness and what we know as the Patriot sign. And she was, I mean, she was ultimately referred for the proper imaging, the proper consultation. She got all of these, all of these things done. But here's a follow-up, and this is very important. This is where we need to get involved. If you take a look, these are subsequent photos. Both nerves, you know, at both dates, both nerves are, are edematous. They're still edematous. And without the photograph, you can't definitively say it's gotten better, which it has. We can see there's a difference. And that's the importance of the, of the photograph. We won't remember this. We won't draw this. We can't describe this but we take a look at it 
and we can see that it's actually gotten better. And when we reduce the venous stagnation, the visual field de facto improved. Now, just turn these arrows the other way. We've gone from here to here and from here to here with the worsening edema. Well, in this situation, what we need to do is be able to tell the managing physician the therapy is not sufficient. The patient is getting worse. So when they get downstream, this doesn't get done. We need to do fields. We need to do photos. We need to do OCT. We need to help with the following. Severe or progressive vision loss, optic nerve sheath decompression can be done, but that is nothing more than unbuckling your, 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 your belt after Thanksgiving dinner. Gives you a little bit more room, but the overall problem is still there. High dose IV steroids and acetazolamide can be done. Lumboperitoneal shunt, it will be done. It'll actually drain it from one body part compartment to another. If they can't have a, a, a sheath uh, decompression or they have intractable headache. But in any patient who has a lumboperitoneal shunt, the development of headache is an emergency. It could mean that the shunt has been blocked. Greg, that brings me to polling question number two. When encountering fluid bilateral disc edema in a 38-year-old obese female, what is the next immediate step? Diamox or recommend weight loss, check the blood pressure, send to the ER, perform OCT. And about halfway through. Yeah, good group here, responding well. Thank you for being live and interactive. This definitely helps us keep allowing us to do these uh, uh, programs. So thanks, everyone. So a few more, please weigh in. Pay attention out there. Please answer the question. Don't make us get Vanessa to go up to you. <laughs> Greg, I think we're coming toward the end. I'm going to share the results, Joe, so give it a second to populate. Okay. There you go. Yeah, immediately check blood pressure. Yeah, it, 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 that will help direct you. Maybe it isn't pseudotumor. Maybe it's malignant hypertension. That's a very important thing to do. Send to the ER. Yeah, we're going to do it if it's if it's disc edema or suspect papillodema, it'll go to the ER with directions. If it's malignant hypertension, it'll go to the ER. It doesn't hurt to take a photograph, perform an OCT, or even do a visual field. You know, you're talking only a couple minutes here. What I don't want to do is prescribe Diamox or recommend weight loss. I have come across colleagues who've looked at a patient, eyeballed them, did a doctor house said, you got pseudotumor, I'm going to put you on Diamox, you'll be fine without doing any of the additional tests. That is the wrong thing to do. Remember, not all elevated discs or, or, or swollen, how all swollen discs or edematous and how edematous discs are, are papilledema. True papilledema is an urgency and you have to treat it as such with a search for a cause. Like I said, many causes can present with papilledema mass lesions, hydrocephalus, venous sinus thrombosis, bleed, meningitis, pseudotumor. And pseudotumor is, is more or less kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, we can't just look at a, a woman who has got bilateral disc edema, she has headache, she's childbearing age, overweight, and say, yeah, I'm gonna prescribe some Diamox and, and we'll see how, how it goes. That's a lot of stuff to remember. So if you can't remember that, I want to remember my ode to a swollen disc. When you think the disc is swollen, the vessels north and south will appear stolen. Not all elevated nerves are edematous, just like not all snakes are venomous. Your thoughts should go to papilledema, but infection and inflammation should still be in your schema. MRI, MRV, and LP are all soon to be. Remember, pseudotumor is a diagnosis of exclusion. 
female and firm does not make it a foregone conclusion. Brain tumors can exist when, exist when the profile is classic. Do the evaluation so they don't end in a casket. And if you can remember that, that's all you need. Which is better, one or two? It's an optometry conference, it's very appropriate. Which is better, one or two? Better one, better two. Can I see it again? Which is better, one or two? Neither. Two gentlemen, one is a distinguished older gentleman, the other is a distinguished middle-aged gentleman, ostensibly with the same diagnosis. Hey Joe, can I break your rhythm here? Sure. I got a text from our uh, conference uh, coordinator here that there's about 40, maybe 60 people without a camera on. It's okay for from a different state, but can you address that right now, Joe? Yes, please. If, if you're Florida, it is essential that we be able to see you. If you don't have a camera on your device, you'll have to let us know. We'll have to monitor you uh, in our second best way, which is log on, log off. Thank you. Good. Now, I want to stress to you, nothing on this slide should imply that either Christopher Plummer or George Clooney is my patient. I'm not saying that, but I'm not, not saying that either. 48 year old male, this actually was a consult from a colleague of mine some time ago, painless loss of visual field. He noticed when he woke up, he's still 20, 20 uh, in each eye. And it has a new onset uh, inferior arcuate defect in his left eye. And we take a look at him. He has a non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in the left eye, a small crowded disc at wrist. This is all glial tissue and, and pretty much a non existing cup. And he has a non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Compare and contrast that to the 74 year old male who presents with the worst headache of his life. He goes to the emergency service of Veterans Administration Hospital. Initially sees a physician assistant who diagnoses him with temple, temple, temple mandibular joint dysfunction. Even though he can completely open up his, 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 his jaw. And that really doesn't coordinate with the worst headache of his life. The emergency department physician overseeing her doesn't really examine him, just concurs. Uh, he ultimately is treated with, with a uh, non-steroidal medication. He comes back not feeling any better. He sees a cardiologist or cardi cardiology fellow, a nurse practitioner. This is all done over about a three week period. He keeps coming in, coming back, not feeling well. At one point he is diagnosed with Lyme disease because they find a tick on him and he's an endemic area. So now he has TMJ and Lyme disease for which he's using uh, antibiotics and, a, uh, and an NSAID. Now when we look at the history, we see that over a three week period, he complains of eye ache, jaw pain, scalp pain, facial pain, silence to the point where he's falling asleep while eating his food malaise and jaw claudication. Uh, during his care, various, various practitioners write different things in the chart. Vasculitis such as temporal artery is highly unlikely, not GCA. However, somebody did order a sed rate and C-reactive protein that came back elevated, but there's no indication that anybody ever actually saw it or did anything about it. Ultimately, an optometrist made the diagnosis, got the medicines that were necessary, but the end result was actually very poor. Greg, I think we're up to polling question number three. A 60 year old patient with headache presents with a pale swollen optic disc. What's the best referral? Neuro-ophthalmologist, hospital ER, internist, or retinal specialist? Everybody's jockeying for position here. And our numbers are climbing. Getting there. 
got to find out a way we can play some Jeopardy music or something. There's got to be some type of plug-in for, uh, for this system. Play some Jeopardy music while this is going on, Joe. That would be good. Come on, a couple more people. We need to get it up to above 90%. Please, please respond. At least one more person. It looks like I'm getting some scribbles on the uh, on the slide, so we can get that erased. All right, I think we're uh, just about there. Okay. All right. Are we sharing the results, Greg? Oh, I thought I did share results. Sorry. All right. So, neuro ophthalmologist, hospital ER, internist, or retinal specialist. Well. When, we're, we, when you have an older person with a headache and a, a pale swollen nerve, we've got to think arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and giant cell arteritis. I'm going to say anybody there is acceptable. I mean, any of those answers is acceptable if it can be done same day. And that's the most important thing. If you can pick up a phone and talk to a neuro ophthalmologist, a retinal specialist, or an internist to ensure that the labs are drawn and steroids are, are, are boarded on this patient in the same day that you see them, then anything is acceptable. The best place to send them, however, is the hospital emergency room with detailed notes saying patient suspect temporal arteritis Please draw said rate C-reactive protein platelets. If elevated, please initiate steroid treatment. And they'll know what to do. The ER physician will, will know what to do. But direct them. They may, they may be off their game that day. Tell them what you're thinking of, why you're thinking about it. So they both have anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. This is a hypoperfusion of the posterior ciliary circulation to the optic nerve head. It may be arteritic or non-arteritic. Now, in non-arteritic, mechanical features and atherosclerotic disease or, or arteriolar sclerotic disease will be the contributory factor, whereas an autoimmune vasculitis is contributed in the arteritic form. It is typically a unilateral presentation, but there's a high incidence of subsequent contralateral involvement if it's arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. 65% of patients will progress to fellow eye involvement within 10 days. Now, non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy can progress to bilateral involvement, but it's on the average of about 32 months. So one is an emergency and the other actually uh, is, is not. And certainly if you see bilateral ischemic neuropathies, you must first and foremost consider giant cell arteritis as the cause, not, not uh, ischemic vascular disease. Now looking at arteritic versus non-arteritic, non-arteritic tends to be a hyperemic swollen nerve. And there is a TL injectasia of the, of the superficial disc capillaries which become engorged in an attempt to reperfuse the infarcted part of that optic disc. In arteritic ischemic neuropathy, the cessation of blood flow is a little bit further is further down. It is a massively chalky white swollen optic nerve with very very poor visual function. When the optic when the fundus appearance does not does not represent the vision. The fundus appearance looks much better than the, the, the vision. We have to consider that it might be ischemic neuropathy. Greg, somebody has actually raised the hand. Is, or is, is there a way we can answer that question? Or maybe if you can put that, quite, Rich, if you can put that question in the chat, it would be a little bit easier. And we'll get that to that after this topic. Yeah, I'm just sure I got bumped. Um, I'll monitor that. Now, I'll watch in the. Uh... I'm watching the questions. The only, the only thing so far, Joe, they want to hear a, an ode for glaucoma. So, Oh, you have to come to our glaucoma talk, but I will absolutely do an ode for glaucoma. Non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, they have risk factors of hypertension, diabetes, smoking, uh, atherosclerosis, 
uh, small optic nerve, cataract surgery, small optic nerve, very important. These are people who have a small disc at risk. 97 to 98, 97% uh, of non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy patients have a 0.2 or less CD ratio, and the other three patients were misdiagnosed. Six to one will be an inferior visual field defect, and not an altitudinal defect, but more or less an inferior arcuate defect. And we don't know why anatomically that happens, but six to one, it's going to be an inferior defect. The nerve is swollen and hyperemic, and the fellow eye is going to have a disc at risk. If you look in the other eye, you see a 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 CD ratio. You really shouldn't be thinking non arteritic ischemic neuropathy. It's rather, rather abrupt, apoplectic, acute, but there is a progressive loss of vision that may actually worsen over several days. And there can be spontaneous recovery of vision of three or more lines of acuity at six months. The earliest I've ever come across this is about age 37. But late 30s to early 40s and beyond is where this disease will, will come. And it is painless, very important characters, painless vision loss. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy is a pallid swollen nerve. There may be flame-shaped hemorrhages, arterial attenuation, neurofiber layer, infarcts. Interesting and in, uh, interestingly enough, here's one thing that to be aware of cotton wool spots. Isolated cotton wool spots in the elderly should prompt you to do a history for giant cell arteritis. Very, very important. Now, the retinal capillaries are too small to be infarcted by these giant cells. So it's probably platelet microembolization uh, further up the vascular tree. You know, interesting, Greg. I'm going to share a, a, an amusing story. I was at uh, I was at a meeting where I was in the audience. I think it was the at the FOA one year, and I came into the auditorium, very big auditorium. Came in late. It was it was dark. I was in the back. Me, no way the speakers could could see me. And one of the speakers was talking about a colleague of mine, friend, longtime friend, was speaking about giant cell arteritis and he started telling a story about me where how I diagnosed and saved a person's vision and life by diagnosing giant cell arteritis based upon one isolated cotton wool spot in the fundus. He really went on and said some very, very complimentary things and you know, Greg, I, I leaned over the person I, I was standing next to and said, that never happened. <laughs> 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 that never happened. Sounds great, but th that, that never happened. They have pain of some sort. Head pain, jaw pain, face pain, eye pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, girdle pain. Severe optic nerve dysfunction is the rule. Visual field defects often can't even be uh, assessed because the vision is so poor. Giant cell arteritis or polymyalgia rheumatic are, are, are risk factors for, for this disease. Uh, a colleague of mine in my new practice uh, asked me a question on a patient. The patient had left. I didn't get a chance to see him, but it really made me very uncomfortable. You know, she, she showed me the images and everything. And it, it was clearly a patient who had what seemed to be a non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. But, Greg, what, 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 what made my hackles rise was the patient also was diagnosed with polymyalgia rheumatica. So they had non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy and a premonitory disease for giant cell arteritis. That is one of the toughest cases, I think, to manage. Yep. Typically in the 70s, uncommon under age 60, but it happens over 50. So once you go over 50, it's always on the menu. And I said a high risk of bilateral involvement is going to, uh, it's going to occur here. Can I, uh, can I make a comment and something off of what you said? Um, yeah. You know, that, that was a great story that you had, um, but I do want to echo that, you know, a lot of us have wide field imaging at our practice. You know, we do it as a wellness. We're taking images and looking at them. And, you know, with that being said, when we started doing ours years ago, I'd find these hemorrhages in the far periphery and 
kind of becomes an art on which ones that you want to work up and which ones uh, you you know you need to to observe or follow and so on and so forth. But what I learned is when you see a cotton wool spot in the back of the eye, you know, and it's not usually from diabetes because that's usually a lot of other retinal issues that are going on to kind of know that it's from diabetes or from hypertension. When you find that isolated cotton wool spot, work it up. Every cotton wool spot is telling you that there's profound ischemia. And we've found some really cool diagnoses uh, over the years uh, from this. So, uh, you know, some vitamin A, some uh, uh, anemias, leukemias, different things like that. So uh, I didn't want to make, you know, light of one isolated cotton wool spot is enough that I work up at the practice. And always consider patient profile. You know, if they're elderly, ask about some of the symptoms. And here are some things to, to think about. Chair, hair, fair, stare. Now, ha most of this I got from Dr. Andy Lee, a prominent neuro-ophthalmologist. Hair, hurts when they comb their hair. Stare, tough for them to walk up stairs. Chair, tough to get out of chairs. These are all things that are characteristic you ask about. And I also say fair, while this does happen to people of color, Caucasians are more, are more common to be afflicted by this disease. So chair, hair, fair, stare. So we have to ask about these non-visual symptoms. Headache in, in over 90% of patients, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication. Don't ask, do you have pain while chewing? Because they'll tell you no. It isn't pain. It's as if they're eating beef jerky or a tough steak that they get very fatigued and their jaw just gets tired or begins to ache. You know, the muscles of mastication will become ischemic. Ear pain, arthralgias, temporal pain, you know, one thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to palpate the temporal arteries and they're going to say, ooh, it hurts. Now, if they don't go, ooh, it hurts and I can feel a pulse. I can feel a temporal, the temporal artery pulse. That kind of mitigates away from temporal arteritis. Malaise, intermittent fevers, or they're just older people that don't do well. They fail to thrive. You know, many a time in my glaucoma service, I'd have an older Caucasian person in, and I'd be asking my history, how are you doing with the drops? You know, how's your vision doing? Okay, does your head hurt? Have you had any headaches? Okay, good. When do you last use your medicine? Have you lost any weight? And the students and residents would not understand how that related to glaucoma. I said, it doesn't. I've got an 82-year-old Caucasian female here. She might have temporal arteritis. I won't know unless I ask. So we have to ask about all of these, all of these things. Examination, of course, we are looking for our findings. Lab study, sed rate, C-reactive protein, and platelet count. Uh, sed rate is, can, be, can be lowered by stats. You can, have a, you can have a false negative. It can be lowered by NSAIDs. So that's why you can get a, you can get a, get a, false, a false negative with a sed rate alone. And if they have a normal chromic neuromocytic anemia, then it's going to be low. C-reactive protein is not affected by statins and NSAIDs and the two tests together are going to be about 98% sensitive. And of course, you have a thrombocytosis and elevated platelet count. So we need to, you know, make our diagnosis and promptly get him steroids. And when vision loss is present, the hospital with an IV is the best because one, complications can be managed. Two, you know they're getting it. Three, the high dose seems to protect the fellow eye and it actually even has brought back some involved eyes so we shouldn't expect it. But good eyes can be lost on, on oral steroids alone. So oral steroids probably aren't the best. Now, in my, you know, in my uh, approach, my gestalt, if I have an older person who has headache, that's concerning. Everything else is fine, no visual problems. I'm going to send them to their primary care physician and ask them to evaluate for temporal arteritis. If I have an older person with vision loss, an artery occlusion, or a, an ischemic neuropathy, and they have, they have constitutional symptoms, they're going to go to the ER. And I'm going to tell the ER physician what my suspicions are, and, and they, will, they will address it promptly. So always think arteritic before non-arteritic 
always keep that in the back of your mind because we don't want to miss that diagnosis. They can have massive vision loss, that chalky white uh, edematous appearance. So which is better, one or two? Patient is bilaterally blind. This one is residual field loss, but otherwise is not bothered. That's a lot of stuff to remember. So what I want to do or share with you is my ode to an ischemic nerve. When your patient's optic nerve is ischemic, you better hope the disc is hyperemic. In non arteritic no treatment is needed and life will rarely be impeded. But if the disc is swollen and pale and the vision is an epic fail, if the patient is 60s, 70s, or 80s, you're going to feel like heat like you're in Hades. ESR and CRP are required, and steroids must be acquired. Remember, when you see a choked disc, always assess the giant cell risk. And if you can remember all that, it'll keep you out of trouble. Greg, are there any questions coming through yet? Nope. Just handout and different things like that. Oh, here's one right here. Um, will, pul will pulse in the temporal artery typically disappear with giant cell arteritis? The answer is yes, generally. Now let's just talk about the, te the greater superficial temporal artery. Is that the vessel that's most important? No, it is a vessel that is the most accessible and most expendable. Now, there may be skip lesions there. There may be, there, there may be non-involvement of the temporal artery. It's just easy to get to and, and, and do the biopsy. We can take both of them. They're, they're not really hard, they're, you know, they're not, they're not really hard vessels to, uh, to biopsy. The best vessel of biopsy is the aorta, but you're gonna kill the patient doing that. But a person can have temporal arteritis and may have minimal involvement of the temporal arteries. So it could, you know, it, it, for the most part, it will be lost because those vessels will have involvement. When I feel a pulse and there's no pain in that area, I'm generally somewhat relieved that, or, or I, I'm less suspicious of it. But if it's tender, if it's hard, it's very indurated, you can actually feel there's no pulse, I got to consider it. But always remember, the temporal artery itself may not be involved or may be minimally involved. That's why there's skip lesions. That's why there are false negative biopsies. And keep in mind that if the temporal artery is involved, there's no connection between the temporal artery and, and, and the eye. It's just that it is a multi-system disorder. The ciliary circulation or at least is what leads to vision loss. And someone asked about the handout, uh, yes. more housekeeping. I just re-sent it into the chat. The problem is if you come in late or if you get dropped off, then you don't have the chat session. So that's why I keep periodically uh, putting it back in the chat. So there it is. It takes a village. 29-year-old female referred to me for glaucoma evaluation due to suspicious cupping with, without any complaints. Uh, pressure is 12 and 13 right and left eye. And I used to get these all the time in the glaucoma service. You know, 29 year old female, young, you know, somebody took a look, didn't like the optic nerve appearance, asked me to take a look. Pressure is sort of non contributory there. And I would see these all the time, just a funny looking nerve or a suspicious nerve, large nerve, large cup. And I used to always tell the students and residents, let's get an OCT, show them it's normal, and send the patient home. So all these, these are always very good, very good referrals because it tells me people are looking at the optic nerve and they get suspicious. Absolute right thing to do. So I do it, we run it, and the nerve fiber layer is pretty robust in, in the right and left eye, but better in the right than the left. In fact, the right and the left actually has some abnormalities there. And the ganglion cell complex looks really pretty good in the, uh, in the right eye and not so good in the left. And it does seem to correspond to what I see in the left eye, but I know this girl doesn't have glaucoma. 
Now, what I would usually do in a situation this is bring them back and, and do a visual field. Young person, she's uh, motivated, so let's, let's run a visual field. Show me a normal field and then we'll send her home. So she turns on a normal visual field in her right eye and she has a small nasal step in her left eye. Now, usually I'd bring the patient back and do the field again because I know the field is wrong. I said, all right, well, she's young, she's motivated, let's just do it again. So we do it again same day and it is still there. So now I have a structural functional concordance. And now I guess they're paying attention because this is not as straightforward as I thought it was going to be. She's 2015 in each eye, pressure's 12 and 13, nothing unusual. I did an undilated look uh, before I, I even did the OCT and the nerves did not look notched or, or, or really even compromised, just a large cup and I really wasn't worried. Gonio was done, it was normal. Pachymetry was thin. But what was notable was she had a marked relative afferent defect in her left eye. It wasn't even a subtle one. It was a, it was a very obvious one. And now I take a look and I dilate her and what do I see there? Large cup to disgratio, large nerves. That's what got her referred in. Good rim tissue, good pink tissue but we are pale from 12 o'clock until three o'clock. And that matches the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell complex. She has a pale optic nerve for about three o'clock hours. Or what we can say is she's got optic atrophy. Now optic atrophy is a challenging optic neuropathy or, opt or, or condition. It's a lot of work. Primary optic neuropathy is degeneration that results in, in a glial replacement, but there's no alteration of the optic nerve. The disc will appear kind of a chalky white or pale, but the margins are distinct, the retinal vessels are normal. Common causes, trauma and compression, compression like a tumor. And there's secondary optic atrophy. This is due to chronic disc edema malignant hypertension, pseudotumor, papilledema, infiltrative diseases. There's consecutive optic atrophy, a degenerate retinal condition such as RP, uh, high, or pathological myopia, central artery occlusion. But these are people who are going to have vasculopathy as well. They're, the nerves will be pale. Sometimes they're kind of greasy or waxy. The margins are okay, but there's a, an attenuation of, of the arterioles. Now, if I see a patient with temporal pallor and a huge macular scar, I'm done. There's your answer. I see a pale nerve in a patient that has a reliable history of a sudden vision loss or a, a retinal artery occlusion. I'm satisfied. I see a pale nerve in a patient who has PRP. I'm done. I'm good with that. If I don't have all those explanations, we have to do something. And temporal disc pallor can be toxic or nutritional if it's bilateral or demyelinating disease if it is uh, unilateral. Problem here is there's so many po possible etiologies. We probably have to work with an internist. We probably have to work with an infectious disease specialist. You may or may not want to send this to the neuro-ophthalmologist, depending how, uh, how com comfortable you are dealing with some of these things and, and, and going through the, the, the differential diagnostic list. But it can be infarction, infection, infiltration, inflammation, trauma, metabolic dysfunction, compression of the nerve or chiasm. The very least, MRI of the orbits, chiasm, and brain without, with and without contrast. Fat suppression in a high field scanning unit. Open MRI is not going to be acceptable. And if you look in the orbit, if you're looking at the optic nerve, fat gets in there. And there's fat in there. And fat is white. And what we're looking for is going to be white. So you have to do fat suppression. You have to say all of this. Contrast dye is very helpful in finding malignant lesions, demyelinating plaque, which can ind indicate multiple sclerosis. But all cases of optic nerve pallor or optic atrophy have to be either investigated or explained. And please don't just say, 
well, the patient probably had a non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Yeah, it's possible, but they have to have the characteristic disc at risk. I've always found non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is great diagnosis of convenience. You know, people use it to explain disc pallor, say it probably had an infarct or ischemic neuropathy. There's no diagnostic test for it, and we, there's no treatment for it if you do diagnose it. So it's often a diagnosis of convenience, and I, I've seen that other things ascribed to that disease that were something else. Systemic causes, sarcoid, tuberculosis, Bichette, cancers, uh, lupus, other collagen vascular disorders or connective tissue disorders, we should say. Metabolic disorders, infectious disorders, syphilis and Lyme, and even autoimmune and uh, autoantibody disorders. So here's a, uh, here's a comment or question. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of a question. Uh, is it possible to get bilateral temporal pallor with age? I work with a geriatric population. I feel I see it more without any other explanation. Well, if a person, I mean, if, if no, I'm going I'm to say, blank, I'm going to say by and large, no. If you have bilateral and good function, you're probably looking at something anomalous you have a, a sloped rim margin, an obliquely inserted nerve. It's hard to call something a neuropathy without dysfunction. So if you have someone who's in his age, it's symmetrical and the function's otherwise very good, I would chalk that up to probably it's uh, just an anomaly that we're looking at, anomaly of the uh, sloping of the margin. Yeah, so let me... Let yeah. me just make this comment here is um, there are people out there that are direct messaging me or whoever that's called private message me on the, in the chat and they're on a device and they're unable to get the handout. So I just put my uh, email address, Greg at optometric edu.com into the chat. And if you guys email me, I'll watch the chat, I'll watch my email and I'll attach the handout that that's being shared. So if you guys need a handout, um, for, for, for tonight and for the TQ purposes, just email me at greg at optometricedu.com and, uh, and I'll send it to you via an attachment via an email. And with that being said, Joe, it's uh, just got a question that popped in. It says, what, uh, do you not run, uh, heavy metal profiles as well to rule out, uh, that type of etiology? The answer is yes. You know, we, we want to work with other physicians trying to identify what is the most likely thing that it could be rather than do a, a scat shot, a, a scatter shot approach. But yes, that is that is something that would also fall in there. So at the very least, we're going to be looking for a CBC, SED, ACE, ANA, double stranded DNA, cardiolipin, and homocysteine, uh, B12, and folate. We also want to test uh, RPR for syphilis. You also got to consider Lyme disease. Uh, chest x-rays are helpful in, in cases of tuberculosis or sarcoidosis. Yeah, heavy metal screening, absolutely, along with a good history. But we try to identify the best possible causes uh, depending on the uh, patient's uh, profile. Now, what was her outcome? We did the, the MRI of the orbits, came out normal. It wasn't the greatest study, but it was sufficient. Then I worked with a primary care physician. We did a, a brain MRI, no lesions. Uh, in concert with the, our consultation, he ordered a, a lupus panel, ANA, double-stranded DNA, said metabolic panel, folate and B12, all normal, RPR, HIV, all non-reactive. Saw the patient back three months, six months, and probably about two years later. Visual field has unchanged. She's still asymptomatic. She has a whopping APD, but doesn't affect her at all. Nothing has changed. We've done our reasonable due diligence. We released her. Here's what I call a family affair. 56-year-old female with glaucoma for five years. Complains of slowly progressive vision loss. Certainly a glaucoma process. She's light perception in the right eye, 20, 30, and left, had used a combination medicine but ran out months ago. Comes in at pressure 19 and 18, average pachymetry, and she looks like this. The nerves are large, the rims are relatively thin, but I think we can easily or, or certainly see 
both nerves are pale. Because of the very poor vision in her right eye, I can't run a visual field, but I can certainly run a visual field in her left eye. She's got a ver vertically oriented visual field defect, strongly suggestive of a chiasmal lesion. And indeed, she had a large pituitary macroadenoma. And interesting, you know, she came with her sister, who was very close to the same age. And uh, I told him, I told him we, we needed to image the patient, we need, needed to image her. And I, I ordered the MRI and I brought her back and I, I was discussing the results with her. And as I was talking to the patient, the patient's sister said, you know, I've got something wrong with my pituitary gland as well. I said, is it an adenoma? She said, yeah, it's an adenoma. And she I use this medicine called, I said, is it called bromocryptine? Yeah, I use bromocryptine. Can I, can I give some to my sister? No, that's not how it works. She needs to see a neurosurgeon. He's a 54-year-old male referred for glaucoma management, had been diagnosed with glaucoma years earlier in another country, but underwent no treatment. He comes in 2030 in the right eye hand motion in his left eye. He had slowly progressive vision loss in his left eye only. He's got a pressure of 30 in the right and 23 in the left. And this is what we see. He's got distinct rim pallor in his left eye. Now, compressive lesions will cause a concentric enlargement of a cup, but it won't notch a nerve like, like glaucoma. Glaucoma is the only thing that will cause focal loss of rim tissue. Compressive lesions can cause a concentric enlargement of the cup, but will do so also at the expense of the rim of, of the color and the perfusion and give you an optic atrophy. So there's distinct rim pallor in the left eye. Cupping does not match the vision. It doesn't matter to me that the patient has a pressure in, in the 30s. There is something else going on here. And clearly we can see he's got a bitemporal defect with a pituitary adenoma so large it's actually compressing the posterior aspect of the left, left optic nerve, giving you the poor vision. So we certainly still need to do fields in the age of OCT imaging because sometimes it's not just glaucoma. But they both have a compressive optic neuropathy from the optic nerve or orbital apex or the chiasm. These can be tumor masses, they can be orbital masses, they can be engorged muscle bellies from thyroid ophthalmopathy. In fact, Graves disease is the number one cause of compressive optic neuropathy, not tumors. Uh, with Graves' disease, it can be bilateral. If it's unilateral, it tends to be some sort of mass lesion. They can have slowly progressive painless vision loss. Proptosis is not usually uh, a feature. There may be some motility restriction, but painless progressive vision loss is highly suspicious of a compressive tumor. The nerve may be initially hyperemic. There may be collateral vascularization. And it's not optociliary shunt vessels. Those are not terms that we, it's not the right term. They're not opto, they're not ciliary, and they're not shunts. But they can have discollateral collateral vessels. Visual fields can be consistent with papilledema in early stages, ischemic neuropathy, glaucoma can almost be anything. But increased concentric cupping from a compressive lesion can, can, can occur, but it doesn't notch a nerve. Glaucoma is the only thing that really notches a nerve. So management is going to be orbital imaging. You want, you want orbits and chiasm. And of course, we're going to consider a thyroid profile if we suspect Graves' disease. Now, that's a lot of stuff to remember. If you can't remember all of that, I want to remember my O2 cup disc. O would have a cup disc pink that my friend had the glaucoma to stink. But have a cup disc pale, call this glaucoma, and you shall fail. Disc and field damage is one side, it simply cannot be abided. It might be trauma, infarct, or meningioma, but if the rim is cut, always remember nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. And if you can remember all of that, that will keep you out of trouble with optic nerve. Greg, is there anything I should turn my attention to? 
No, sir. Uh, well, it just says one new message. Let me see two new messages. Um, uh, just got an ode, the odes rock. It says ode rocks. So oh. good job on the odes. I am sending also sending emails to those. Uh, I got a litany of them. So I'm going to be sending emails to Joe. So All right, very good. All right. She's a 42 year old female who has a sudden painless loss of vision for about a week. Getting worse, not getting better. It started off as a non disturbing dimming, but it dropped rapidly off. She's 2020 and 2400 with a mild relative afferent defect. I'm saying that specifically because that's actually very characteristic of what she has. She is full to confrontation fields, but she has a central or secocentral scotoma in her left eye. Biomicroscopy is normal. Pressure is 18 and 19, and she looks like this. We have massively edematous optic nerve. We have juxtapapillary edema. We have juxtapapillary exudation. And we have an accumulation of lipid exudate in this Henley's layer which is kind of pointing from the optic nerve right to the macula, and what we call is a macular star or even a partial macular star, and a unilateral disc edema and a macular star. Now, this will occur in, in ischemic neuropathies. It'll occur in pseudotumor, and it occurs in infectious optic neuropathies. Now, she has no known HIV risk factors that are reported. She had a severe flu and lymphadenopathy about a month earlier. She claims no tick bites or rashes. She does have an exposure to cats, does not uh, relate any sort of scratches from the cat. Now, serology, testing for syphilis, HIV, Lyme disease, uh, toxoplasmosis, toxocariasis, uh, looking for tuberculosis, all negative. But she comes back positive titers of Bartonella Henselae. And she is thus known as having cat scratch neuroretinitis. Bartonella tells us we have a cat scratch disease. So she has neuroretinitis or a subset of infectious optic neuropathy. This is a very big, somewhat difficult to understand topic. I'm going to try to ferret down in the next five minutes. There are a number of things that can cause infectious optic neuropathy, syphilis, toxoplasmosis, Lyme. Neuroretinitis is only a subset of it. It's a very characteristic type of appearance. Now, syphilis can give you a retral bulbar, a bulbar, a neuroretinitis, okay, or a perineuritis. Now, retral bulbar or bulbar syphilitic neuropathies are going to have severe vision reduction. Perineuritis, that is inflammation of the optic nerve sheath, and that is seen easily on a coronal section of an MRI. You can see it's the enlarged sheath. They'll have disc edema, but pretty normal vision. So write this down, guys. If you see disc edema and good vision, we got to consider perineuritis. Perineuritis, we got to consider syphilis. Very important. Lyme disease. You know, I don't have a lot of Lyme disease where I am. It's possible. It does happen, but not like Lyme, Connecticut or up north. Lyme disease is very similar to syphilis. In fact, both are spiral ketal bacteria. One is Treponema pallidum. The other is Borrelia burgdorferi, syphilis and Lyme disease, respectively. Now, Lyme disease comes from the bite of a mammalian deer tick. Now, if you're around large animals, in the endemic areas in the north. You know, it was first discovered in Lyme, Connecticut, or identified in Lyme, Connecticut. I mean, Lyme disease is in Australia at this point. So it can be anywhere. But people who spend time in woods exposed to ticks, particularly mammalian deer ticks, hunters, farm animals, you know, close contact with, with, with nature, so to speak can give you Lyme disease. And Lyme and syphilis mimic one another. In fact, they're so close, people with Lyme disease can test positive for syphilis and, and vice versa. So I always like to look for both. 
toxoplasmosis, HIV, AIDS, sudden megalovirus, very destructive to vision. You're not going to get visual recovery. Neuroretinitis is a cat scratch lymphoreticulosis, and the prognosis is actually really pretty good. Neuroretinitis, the APD is mild compared to the vision loss, and that's an important characteristic. You know, vi the vision loss is more you know severe than you would than you expect given the, the relatively minor APD. Telling you this, this is more retinitis than it is neuro. Now, the macular star is actually a late find. It usually takes a couple of weeks. A serious macular detachment from the optic nerve to the, to the macula is characteristic of early neuroretinitis. So you may not have, and this is the case, we can see the swollen nerve, there's no exudate there. But if there is an attachment from here to here, I don't mean fluid, I don't mean spongy edema, I mean a serous detachment. Get out your OCT, there's your diagnosis. The macular star actually comes pretty late. But that serous detachment between the disc and the macula is going to show you that it's neuroretinitis. 62-year-old female with strep throat. She has count fingers vision uh, at eight feet in the right eye, 20, 25 left. She's on antibiotics, antibiotics for a day. She has a very mild APD for count fingers vision. She's got blurred vision for three days. Swollen nerve, there's no exudate there at all, but look, and that's not, I'm not talking just a little bit of fluid. There is a serious detachment of the, uh, of the macula. That is neuroretinitis. Neuro, there are many potential causes of both neuroretinitis and, and infectious optic neuropathy. Toxoplasmosis, toxocariasis, measles, syphilis, Lyme disease, herpes, zoster, tuberculosis, malignant hypertension, ischemic neuropathy, Bartonella, very common. Fleas are the vectors. You don't have to be scratched. It isn't the scratch, it's the bite of the fleas. Now, the prognosis for visual recovery is really excellent if this is Bartonella and lymphoreticulosis from cat scratch disease. Toxoplasmosis, toxicariasis, anything else, they need treatment. Toxoplasmosis, syphilis, Lyme disease, herpetic disease, these all, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I saw a patient with, uh, or, or a colleague of mine, I consulted with her patient actually had uh, a herpes a herpes related neuroretinitis or infectious optic neuropathy. These are things that need treatment. If it's cat scratch disease, they really don't need treatment. They will return to normal or near normal without, with or without treatment. Caveat, if they're immunosuppressed, we probably should consider treatment. There has been antimicrobial therapies that have been employed. Uh, there's a number of things. Probably the most common is doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for a month. There's no evidence from peer review literature that tells us that any antimicrobial therapy for cat scratch neuroretinitis is going to affect the outcome. It's going to can have a good, good outcome either way. Same thing for intravitreal injection of the anti-VEGFs. You know, people do that because the, the macula is swollen. You know, it's, it's actually detached. They will do that. There is no evidence that's beneficial. That's a lot of stuff to remember. So if you can't remember all that, I want you to remember my ode to an affected nerve. When the vision is poor and the APD mild, it's often a bite of something wild. If the disc is swollen and macular swelling great, it's neuroretinitis and the star comes late. Syphilis and Lyme are much alike and cause similar titers to spike. One is actually transmitted, the other not. Unless the patient is much weirder than you thought. So if you can remember all that, that's all you need to know. And now let's go on to some retinal vascular disease. Cases, I don't feel good. He's a 66 year old black male who complains of a sudden painless blurring of his left eye of three days duration. 
He's never had any previous eye or medical care and comes in, he wants glasses to help clear his vision. He's 20, 30 right eye, hand motion left with a relative amperin defect in the left eye. Now he's got a good appetite, but a poor diet. You know, he's Doritos, Cheerios, Oreos, nachos, anything that ends in O's is what he eats. But he's overall fairly well nourished, just a poor diet. I got a picture of the Godfather of Soul, James Brown, because they share the same name. My patient's name is also James Brown. And no, I am not violating his PIP of privacy. You'll see why in just a little bit. But unlike the Godfather of Soul, he feels good, at least he did till he died, our James Brown feels not so good. And we take a look and he's, we see this. He's got a pale nerve. He's got an edematous pale fundus. He's got thready attenuated arterioles. He has a cherry red spot and he has a classic appearance of a central retinal artery occlusion. This is a painless sudden loss of vision, usually around 2400 or worse. Although if they have a cilial retinal artery, the vision may actually be better in the 2040 to 2060 range. Retinal edema and a white fundus due to hypoperfusion because blood is not getting to the through the central retinal artery, but it is diffusing from the ciliary circulation. And that cherry red spot that we see there is actually the choral capillaris, what we see is the underlying choroidal circulation. Usually people who are elderly, 60s and above. It can happen to younger people often with, with some unusual causes. But be aware of the early and late appearance. Now, late appearance, what, what, what I'm showing you here is the classic textbook appearance of a central retinal artery occlusion. Not everything is classic, not everything is textbook. Late in the disease, several weeks later, patients will have a seemingly perfused fundus, but the disc will be pale. It will, it will won't have a cherry red spot, it won't be pale, but it will it will have attenuated vessels, very thready vessels, a sudden loss of vision by history and disc pallor. Now early on the average of, uh, of an hour or hours, if you see this really early, it actually looks normal. There's no cherry red spot, there's no disc pallor. The vessels look maybe a little thready. Fundus is well perfused and you'll be scratching your head thinking what is going on here? Always remember this, sudden painless loss of vision, APD. That'll put you into thinking this could be a new onset central artery occlusion. Greg, let's pull up polling question number four. A 60-year-old patient with an acute central retinal artery occlusion. What is the best management plan? Immediate referral to a stroke unit, immediate referral to a retinal specialist, immediate breathing into a brown paper bag and ILP reduction, or immediate referral to a neuro ophthalmologist. A lot of things going, we're going, we're going, we're going. Yeah, it's going well. Part of this live and interactive out there. So please respond to the polling question. Well, we have a lot of uh, varied ideas here. Yeah, they're coming. They're getting here slowly but surely. Couple more people, let's go. All right, good. We got there, Joe, look at that. Yep, Nine all right, so let's, let's share it, Greg. So I got, a, I got a question. It seems that I get a little bit better with a red paper bag, is that? Um, no, that, that will not work. No, has to be. Yep, because we all agree, no matter where you went to school, SUNY, Southern, Nova, PCO, ISO, we're all taught it's a brown paper bag. So when you go to the grocery store, they ask you paper or plastic, I always say paper. It gives you a tool to use in the office. 
And we have an edging here by two percentage point, immediate referral to a stroke unit. We'll talk more about that uh, in just a little bit. Excellent. Now the vast majority of these will be emboli from the, usually from the heart, which are calcific or carotid, which are cholesterol and more common that lodge the level of lamina cribrosa. The intraluminal thresh, uh, pressure is lowest there. The vessel has to crimp and squeeze down through that uh, lamina cribrosa. And if we have a, an emboli, it can block there. Now there are other causes, intraluminal thrombosis, dissecting aneurysm, basal spasm, arterial necrosis, and giant cell. About 5% of central red artery occlusions are not embolic, but they're thrombotic and necrotic from giant cell. So whenever you see a central red artery occlusion, we have to assess for the giant cell risk. That's why I talked about the Ark My Fellows uh, good diet. I mean, he was well nourished, poor diet. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't anorexic. And the reason only about 5% of artery occlusions are caused by giant, are, are caused by giant arteritis is the vessel is just generally too small. There's only a small part of the central red artery that actually is big enough to be affected by that disease. We always got to consider it. But for the most part, it's going to be usually cardiac emboli, which are calcific, and they are very impactful. They don't, they don't allow blood to flow often as a, as a cholesterol emboli, but caveat being cholesterol emboli are more common, so they do cause it as well. Now, what kind of treatment? We, we, we've heard all kinds of things, paracentesis, suck, suck out some aqueous, lower IOP, try to reduce vascular resistance, spit out that emboli to go down to the branch and get some vision back. Carbogen, that's a mixture of carbon dioxide uh, and oxygen that's breathed uh, in, you know, in, in the hospital to increase CO2 levels. And that's what the hyperventilation is, increase CO2 levels, try to get vasodilation and moving that emboli further down. Digital massage, glaucoma medicines, uh, some clot busters. The, the, the American Heart Association is going to be embarking on a study very shortly, funding a study about uh, clot busters and central and artery occlusions. And, you know, the uh, window of opportunity is very variable, but does anything work? The answer is generally no. These are things that really have only anecdotally been reported to help. I, I don't, I've never met anybody who's met anybody who has gotten vision back uh, as, as a physician. Hyperbaric oxygen, that's actually, you know, central artery occlusion is actually an approved indication for hyperbaric therapy. Now, I was at a conference and the, uh, the manager or director of the uh, hyperbaric uh, chamber from Miami was there and said, yeah, we, get, we occasionally get them in, but it's generally too late, nothing really works. Systemic so considerations, atherosclerosis, giant cell, hypertension, diabetes will explain most of these issues in older people. And in younger people, we have to start looking for other conditions uh, such as disc drusen, cardiac uh, arrhythmias, arrhythmia, clotting factors, hyperviscosity syndromes. Now, the main cause of death is myocardial infarction. We have to worry about subsequent stroke. Neovascularization is not a common thing. In fact, my entire career, I've only recently see, have seen neovascular glaucoma arise from a retinal artery, a truly diagnosed retinal artery occlusion because the retina is, is dead. It's not releasing any VEGF for uh, Neo to grow off of. Well, I diagnosed James, told him what, what it was. He had a stroke in the eye and he was very, very calm individual. He said, are you, are you sure? You sure, Doc, I'm okay? I mean, will glasses work? I said, no, glasses work. You sure? I'm sure. Said, okay. And that was it. He was very, very calm about everything. But, you know, this is the tip of a systemic iceberg. And we have to start looking for some things. So he never really had any, any recent medical care. So I recommended him to an internist and said, I want to see you back in three months to see how you're doing. You know, don't, don't fall through the crack type of follow-up. And I sent him off, never expecting to see him again. 
So I did refer him for medical care. And to my surprise, not only did he come back, but he actually went to a physician. When he came back three months later, he'd been diagnosed with hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia. And here's a different person. Hey, Mr. James. Hey, hey Mr. Brown. How you doing? Because I'm scared. At this point, he had several toes amputated from diabetes. He had now a whole host of things wrong with him. He had been through myriad, a myriad of tests. He was on multiple medicines. And he died within a year from a heart attack. So that's why you know, I'm not violating his, his privacy. He's no longer with us. But people now with retinal artery occlusions need to be referred to a stroke unit. These people with retinal artery occlusion, retinal ischemia, not vein occlusion, retinal artery, branch artery, central retinal artery, and TIA, what we used to know as transient ischemic attack. These are, there is a subset that may be at high risk of, uh, of cerebral infarction and cardiac ischemia. And this comes from doctors Nancy Newman and Valerie Buse. Uh, they've been talking about this uh, recently. In fact, the American Heart Association is seeking our endorsement in the Academy of Optometry for a while for a position paper. The American Heart Association is in the process of reclassifying CRAO as stroke. That it, that a central artery occlusion is not an ocular stroke; it's a stroke. That's going to be the new definition. And these are people who need a diffusion weighted MRI. People who have a, an acute artery occlusion, branch artery occlusion, TIA, where they transient lose, transient lose vision, nothing else wrong, they need to go to be imaged immediately. And they find that the, these ipsilateral silent lacunae infarcts on these patients. And if these are present on diffusion weighted MRI, these are people who are at a high risk of catastrophic stroke. And if that's present, these are people who are going to be admitted to the hospital. This is central artery occlusion, branch artery occlusion, transient vision loss that you think is vascular in nature. They but Joe, need, just, yeah. uh, just to clarify, because we get this quite a bit, has nothing to do with the venous side. Exactly. This is retinal, retinal ar arterial ischemia. Even a patient who's got, who, who had five minutes of blackout of vision in one eye, which came back, that's the same thing. That patient needs to go within 24 to 40 hours to a stroke unit to a stroke ready hospital. So this is, is a new paradigm in how we manage these patients. Diffusion weighted MRI is gonna identify a subgroup of patients at very high risk of major stroke. And it has to be done within 24 to 40 hours to prevent a catastrophic stroke, a, per, you know, a, a permanent debilitating stroke. I got a call 11 o'clock uh, from the ER physician at Sarasota Memorial because I was on call. And he's, he said, Can, I hate to call you so late. Let me, I'd like to run something by you. And we're talking about it. And it sounded like a transient ischemic attack, you know, transient monocular vision loss that, that resolved. So, you know, what do I do? I do, do I get the CTA? I said, yeah, I get a CTA and get a diffusion weighted MRI. And you're looking for something that is, you know, is a silent lacunae infarct. You know, so, okay, if I don't find anything, tell them to see you tomorrow. So, yeah, tell them to see me tomorrow. If I find something, do I get them to stroke neurology? So, that's exactly it. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good night. That was done. So, you tell the patient, go to the emergency to the department and tell me had a retinal stroke. Don't send them their PCP, cardiologist, neurologist, or neuro-ophthalmologist. This is coming from two neuro-ophthalmologists saying this themselves. Don't send them to us. We can't do anything. Send them to the stroke hospital. And don't try to tame the work up yourself. So that brings me to polling question number five. Greg? And then after that, we do have a couple comments and questions, Joe. So okay. let's go. Let's launch the poll. Okay. 60-year-old patient. This is the exact same question. Presents with acute central retinal artery occlusion. What's the best management plan? Stroke unit, retinal specialist, 
breathe into a pe brown paper bag and lo lower the ILP or refer it to a neuropneumologist. Number five and number four, the same question. I want to see if we've changed behaviors at all. Doing great, doing yeah. great. Yeah, doing well here. We're whipping through this one now. All right, you want me to yep. end the poll? I don't know, Joe. It looks like we might have some people in, uh, with some stock in brown paper bags. Exactly. Yeah, but w it's a new paradigm shift. <clears throat> I was actually saw a case reported on ODs, um, shared on ODs on Facebook of a central red artery occlusion. And the, uh, the doctor, she, she was very astute in, uh, <clears throat> in, in, referring the patient for a workup for giant cell arteritis, but was not aware of this, this paradigm shift and did not send the patient to a stroke unit. The patient had a hemispheric stroke uh, within a day. Excellent. You know, I actually have a couple, whenever I present this in my, in my lectures, Joe, of un unfortunate cases like that, that, uh, you know, people are, were asking for advice or, uh, said that they didn't realize that and they wanted everyone to know. So I have a couple screenshots on that. So that's what we want to do. We want to keep spreading the, the word on this one. So um, that, go, ahead. go ahead. You have an ode? Let me see what Man, you got. Cause, what, cause what I, do the questions? Um, so just going back to the Lyme, uh, Patricia here mentioned in, in the 80s when she lived on Long Island, every park ranger on Fire Island, looks like Nation, National Sea, National Sea, uh, sure, had Lyme, so just making the, the comment on that. And then following that, it says, how often do you work up the patient for giant cell arteritis? How often do you work up the patient for giant cell arteritis? Under what circumstance? Yeah, that's, that's all I have, and I wasn't sure if it was part of. If the answer is, if the question is with an artery occlusion, how often do I do, I do it? First and foremost, stroke unit. Second will be for giant cell arteritis, and that can be done in the stroke unit. Yeah, that's the best place for someone, with, right? It, it, even though they're impending a stroke, and that's what ha happens to these people with giant cell, the best place for a person with giant cell, if they get diagnosed, is at the hospital to start the steroids. So, um, Private, direct here, so uh, I'll keep the name un. Uh, unannounced. It says, to clarify, all patients with TIA symptoms should be referred to a stroke unit? Question mark. The answer, the answer is yes. And I'll give you, I'll, I'll qualify that. Trans and vision loss is a bugger. When I was on call a couple, about two weeks ago, on Thanksgiving, actually, I got a call 11 o'clock at night and a woman had trans and vision loss. And it was associated with flashing lights and it was in both eyes and it moved across her vision. I mean, obviously that was a migraine. So this is a challenge because we have to go by a good history. Blurred vision, no. Bilateral, no. Monocular and either total or sectorial blindness, blackness, yes. Caveat, if it's within 48 hours. Yeah. Once you go beyond 48 hours, we don't really know exactly what to do. I, I had a patient, a glaucoma patient, who came to me after about seven days. Well, at that point, I didn't send her to the ER because we're not really clear that the benefit is 24 to 48 hours because if they're going to have a major stroke, that's about when it's going to happen. So, so we, we, have, oh, we, have, we, we, have, we have to get it then. So I told her, if this ever happens again, do not come to me. Go to the stroke unit. We, we identify where she's supposed to go. In my new practice, a uh, patient told me he had a history of ocular migraine. And we went through and we discussed it. He was very clear. This had happened several years ago. He was very clear. And I said, it is not an ocular migraine. You know, this is... You're, you're, the, the history that if you gave them the same history, 
that you're giving me, you had a TIA. And calling that ocular migraine is what I call killing patients the old fashioned way. I told him, if this ever happens to you, do not come to me. Go right to the stroke unit, go right to the ER. That's the most important because he told me he had five minutes of complete and total vision loss in one eye. And that is not an ocular migraine. So if you can identify a patient who has had has vision loss, one eye, complete ER. But it's got to be soon. After about 48 hours, they might be out of that major catastrophic stroke window. And, you know, when we when we look at or when patients here like fast, face, arm, uh, speech, weak, like nobody mentions vision in, in, in anything of stroke to the patient. The, the AA, the American Heart Association is now reclassifying central artery occlusion as a stroke. Another question, Greg, or a comment? Yeah, um, there's, there's a few here and I can probably bring some closure to some of this. And one of the caveats that I want to point out is because since I learned about this probably about a year and a half ago, fortunately or unfortunately, these have come into the practice. And one of the best things that you can say to the retinal or to the emergency room is they had a retinal stroke. Right. You could say a central retinal artery occlusion, just but remind them, but that's a retinal stroke. Oh, okay. And then, you know, they snap into action, they get it. So, um, so that's just a little caveat. So the question, Joe, was, you know, how often do you work up the patient for GCI? And they did reply, uh, the person did reply and say, um, with a central retinal artery occlusion. So um, over to the ER for that one. And then they'll wear it, rule out a stroke and then they'll rule out GCA on that. Yeah, but I mean, here, here, here's a caveat. If if she is uh, a a 78 year old frail Caucasian female, I'm going to emphasize it. If he's a a 58 year old obese male, I'm not going to emphasize it. I mean, I'm going to say that it should be considered, but it's not my strong suspicion. So a lot of it looks depends on the uh, on the profile. And then uh, one of our colleagues put, what if it's an older CRVO, but the, the resident never had, or the patient maybe never had a workup? So let me remember, we're not talking about CRVOs, we're talking about CRAOs, and that's what we don't know what to do after 48 hours, right? So CRVOs, you just follow them like you usually do, but if it's an older CRAO, Joe, go ahead and take it from there. Because you kind of covered it, but you might as well say it again. Yeah, old. I mean, the older CRAO is my O to the artery occlusion. I'll I'll wrap it with that one. And then when I the got questions after that. So do your okay. ode. When the vision is poor and the and the fundus is pale, a branch or a laminar emboli has caused a fail. Heroic measures are really helpful, and vision return is doubtful. In an oldie, always remember, giant cell it may be, get it, hurry and get an ESR and CRP. The retina is infarcted and dead, so Neo, you should not dread. But here's where you must not choke. Send the ER, they're actually having a stroke. I think that will summarize it. Yeah, the, the odes are awesome. They're very appreciated as, as the comments here. Um, if a patient had a workup in the emergency room and then the ER sent the patient to you for follow-up as stroke was ruled out, what is your approach for your workup and follow-up? Workup and follow-up of central retinal artery occlusion? It's not specified, but let's say yes. The answer is if they went, if they went, well, we still will watch for Neil. We're going to to assess their vision, but now I'm going to get them to a cardiologist or an internist because this is a person who is getting a high risk for myocardial infarction in the next in the next five years. Another question here: How about in a young patient? Do you work up for hypercoagulable etiologies? Yes, and you know, my I, I have to apologize. My timing was off. I was enjoying myself too much. I didn't get as far as I wanted to. Let me end end it by answering with this case that we didn't quite get to. 
It was a younger person of age 45 who had a central retinal vein occlusion. What was the, what was the overall question again, Greg? Says, how about in a patient, uh, a young patient, do you want to work up hypercoagulable state? Yes. Do you want to wrap up these other stroke ones before moving on, or do you want to? Yes, go right ahead. Okay. Those stroke ones. Then we'll wrap up with this in minutes. Yeah. Would you refer a to? Would you refer to a stroke? I guess it's referred to a stroke hospital for a branch retinal artery occlusion as well. Yep. Absolutely. That's that's emboli and that's heading up the vascular tree. C R A O B R A O and T I A. Yes. All of those, everyone out there, nix the paper bag. Don't have to send them to an internist, retinologist, send them to the hospital, especially if it's within 48 hours. Do you recommend any aspirin on the way to the stroke unit? Doesn't hurt to take, to take an aspirin that does that, that, well, I, 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 it sounds like it, it, it doesn't hurt, but patient could be having a hemorrhagic stroke. So, so yeah. I'm going to rethink that. The answer yeah. is I would not do it. We're optometrists. Let, let the ER take care of that. Right. That's and that I did ask that to, to Nancy or Valerie. I can't remember which one. And they said, well, if they're going right to the hospital, you, know, you, know, you might do something with you know to help, but you also might do something to hurt if they're on their way. Just kind of let let them work their magic over there. Um, let's see. If you have a patient with monocular vision loss for five minutes a week ago. Would you still refer for MRI or have the internist work up? No, that's going to that. I'm gonna I'm gonna send that to the internist. I'm gonna tell her or him what my suspicions are. I would say you should probably get get an MRI to see if they they've had an event. But the critical period of time has passed. And then one more is how often have you seen neovascularization with a CRAO? Once. In my, in my entire career, I've, I've seen it one time. Yeah, I'm probably about the same N in 25 years. CRVO, yes. CRAO, it kills it pretty dead. So it's hard for VEGF to be released. So dead is dead. So, but the answer all right, Joe, that- I think that. Yeah, to just to answer that last the last last question somebody had about about coagulopathies in a young person. Here's a, a person 45 years old who had a central retinal vein occlusion that was non-ischemic. She underwent uh, steroid injections because anti-VEGF was not in vogue at that time, and she was recommended to uh, to get some medical evaluations. And I, in fact, I got involved after she'd been released by from the retinal specialist to, to, to do the medical evaluation. And there are a number of things we have to look for, but in younger people, we have to look for clotting factors and autoimmune disease. I referred her out to a PCP and nothing really came up as significant, except she had some elevated anti-cardiolipin, anti-G, uh, anti-GM antibodies, suggestive of an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now she had been recommended for for anticoagulant therapy, but she never went through. Long and short, she actually had a repeat uh, central retinal vein occlusion sometime uh, earlier, uh, later, and she went really ischemic. And what she actually had was primary antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now people who have connective tissues disorder, such as lupus, will have elevated antiphospholipid antibodies. That's just secondary, secondary, secondary part of that condition. And those antiphospholipid antibodies recognize the phospholipids in cell membrane as being formed. So they, they create a coagulopathy or, or disrupt the uh, coagulation cascade. Now, there are patients out there that don't have connective tissue disorders. They don't have collagen vascular disorders. They don't have lupus but they still have elevated antiphospholipid antibodies. And when there's no other identifiable cause, we call that primary antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And these are people who tend to be younger, many times female. In fact, uh, my former workout partner who's a male has this. He, he had a TIA, he had a dysphagia. 
But when I talk about this, I usually meet people in the audience, uh, usually young females, who say, I, yeah, I have this disease. They discover it when I lost three pregnancies because the, the, this coagulopathy has a predilection for the retinal vascular system and the placental vessels. So in people who are younger, who have, who have vascular occlusive disease, vein and artery, all right, we also have to consider this as well. And I like working with a primary care physician and tell them to think about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. I've diagnosed a number of these in conjunction with the interns because we think about these. These are, these are thrombotic episodes in the retinal vascular system as well as loss of pregnancy. And it's due to this autoimmune disorder of, a, of an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And if we don't think about it, we don't get the patients tested. So with it, I think we've exhausted our time even when we started uh, after our housekeeping. So I think we're ready to wrap it up, Greg. Yeah, I mean, we started 7.15. So, I mean, I would go two more minutes to make sure we stay on. on... I think, no, 7.15, we, we've actually gone over our time by a couple minutes. We're good. So with that. Well, you I have a couple questions. Oh, I have another one. So it says, so CRVOs go to the PCP, not ER, not retina. So this is yes. CRVOs. Well, CRVO with macular edema or neovascularization does go to retina. No macular edema, no, no neovascularization. We can work with them or with retina, but with internal medicine. But they are not going to the ER because that is venous. See, what the, the whole genesis, what causes the retinal artery occlusion or the transient ischemic attack is generally embolic. And that embolic phenomenon can also go to the cerebral vessels or maybe already has gone to the cerebral vessels and they can actually see that they have infarcted already. But the venous system is, is an entirely different system. Anything else there, Greg? Um, looking, looking, looking. I think we got everything. I was scrolling back through the all the previous ones, and I think we're good here, Joe. All right. 